Hi, Robin. Hi, Will. How are you afternoon. doing today? All right. How are you? Uh, I'm doing uh, excellently. It's a beautiful day here in the Washington, D.C. You know, metropolitan <laughs> area, isn't it? Yeah, it was supposed to storm this afternoon, but it hasn't. Yeah, and, looks good. and so uh, uh, should, we should introduce ourselves uh, for the benefits of the viewers. I'm Will Wilkinson uh, here at the Cato Institute, and you are Robin Hansen. Ro uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Robin. <laughs> I'm Robin Hansen here at George Mason University. I'm a professor of economics, and I do an unusually wide variety of topics, which I guess we will touch on through the next hour. Yeah, I, we will. We will touch on an unusually wide variety of topics. I'm, I doubt we'll get to all of them, however. Uh, no, that would be pretty hard. That would be pretty hard. Um, let's. Uh, one of the things you do, uh, Robin, is you. Uh, one of the ways that I'm sort of very lightly affiliated with you is you've got this blog called Overcoming Bias Online that many of our readers, or many of our viewers, I'm sure, read from time to time. Uh, how did that blog come about? What What's the idea of overcoming bias? Well, I mean, it has a, a general theme, but, you know, if you asked how did it come about, presumably the main causal reason was uh, peer pressure. Uh, as you know, I'm at a place here, George Mason, where there's this high concentration of bloggers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they were all talking about their blogs at lunch, and, and I didn't have one. Yeah. Did and you so, feel left you know, out? I did. I did. I felt like I wasn't just not up with the, the group. So now I have my own blog, and so I can be more part of the conversation. Yeah. Well, that's a, well what, why did you pick the... Uh, the <laughs> does it have a theme? Is it about overcoming yeah, so bias? It does have a theme. So, I mean, most people just have a blog that is about, you know, me and my opinions about things. Uh, which worked pretty well, but I have this uh, old ideal of creating a community around some sort of a cause or, you know, something larger than yourself. And I was trying to, I've been struggling for a while to say how, how could I define that, what, what could summarize that for me. And I have mm -hmm. uh, this variety of work, including in prediction markets and in the rationality of disagreement. And I was thought that this was the encompassing topic to uh, pull it all together. The one ring to rule them all, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what's your interest in uh, in bias? Why should we overcome it, Robin? Well, you shouldn't necessarily <laughs> if you uh, don't share my goals. Um, yeah. What, so, what are the, bias, so, what are, so, what are those goals? <laughs> well, to believe the truth. Uh, ah. To put it starkly. Very uh, romantic. To the extent you're someone who, who puts a really high priority on that. Now, of course, everybody at some degree wants to believe the truth. Uh -huh. um, but the question is, how much are you willing to pay? And there's a difference between uh, you know spending all of your waking hours studying things to learn more truth, and just being honest about the things you already think you know something about. And so this yeah. is more focused on the latter, just being as honest as you can about the evidence in front in front of you and and behind you and where it leads. So um, well, what do you think is people? Go go ahead. Uh, no, I'm just, it's, it's something that you might think was kind of trite as a goal because almost everyone gives lip service to it. So then, you know, what's the point? You might as well say, you know, we're for life and, and happiness or something. Yeah, uh, but, I, I'm for it. <laughs> but it seems like when, once you understand that there are these biases and that they distort you and, and that there are ways you could try to overcome them, then it seems like people spend remarkably little effort actually bothering with that. Yeah, so... so, so then it, Tell us a little bit about some of these biases and 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 what some of the evidence that people uh, tend to not to actually take them in account uh, into account in a way that uh, suggests that people don't care about truth as much as uh, we are inclined to say that we are. Well, it's easy to review standard things: biases, uh, wishful thinking, overconfidence, um, arrogance. Um, and then the psychologists have a large laundry list of particular things that mm -hmm. can go wrong. Um, you know, paying attention to things in front of you as opposed to things out of your eyesight. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, honestly, most of uh, human conversation and, uh, you know, the tradition of humanity going a lot back a long way sort of recognizes most of these. We're, we're, we're very familiar with the idea that uh, other people can be mistaken about things for these sorts of reasons. Um, but we're not as eager necessarily to see our, our own biases. Uh, one of the the strongest ones I think that's most dramatic is uh, this bias to um, to disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a topic on which uh, you know you and I may want to explore here. Mm -hmm. That um, apparently um, people 
like us, but different in the sense that they were just trying to believe what's true without having the other various agendas that you and I have in choosing our beliefs, uh, would not knowingly disagree. Mm -hmm. um, if you accept that and you see the vast amount of knowing disagreement that happens all around us, then you have to uh, expect that the reason we knowingly disagree all the time is that we don't just want to believe it's true. We uh, have other agendas. We like to think well of ourselves. We like to uh, think well of our group. Mm -hmm. um, we like to show our creativity and autonomy and independence and dominance. Mm -hmm. and we can do all these things through our beliefs um, at the cost, though, of accuracy. So uh, so what do you think is... Uh, now, now, sometimes when I've been read some of your writings about uh, bias and disagreement, um, I get the sense that there's something like that, that you think, and you just correct me if I'm wrong about what you think, but that you might think that there's a kind of uh, collective action problem going on here, that, that, that there's actually a lot of benefits that individuals can get from being biased. So you can... Uh, 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 certain kinds of uh, strategic disagreement can uh, be good for you in particular ways, but um, all of these biases compounded uh, impedes the, you know, the, 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 the search for truth in a systematic way, uh, which leaves us a lot worse off than we might otherwise be. If everybody were more truth-oriented and were more keenly uh, on the lookout for all the biases to which they might be prone, we'd make a lot faster progress in, you know, coming up with the technologies that, say, would uh, uh, lead to longer lifespans or lead to sort of greater rates of economic growth and therefore prosperity and sure. health and so forth. Um, but that a lot of these sort of very sort of myopically self-serving biases uh, cause this sort of big problem in actually getting at the truth. Is that is that part of the your overall yes. view? Yes, so I think it's the biases we have aren't mostly accidents. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have to, mostly they have systematic tendencies, and those systematic tendencies can be understood in terms of function. Mm -hmm. they, they serve us in various ways. So I think it's not so much a matter of there's various random mistakes that we make that we have to fix, but that we are built with various tendencies uh, to uh, to serve our interests at the expense of uh, having accurate views of the world. Uh, and that many of in many ways, yes, there is a collection action active problem there. Um, mm -hmm. Although, on the other hand, there's a sense in which when we disagree, uh, we contribute in certain ways to uh, some collective actions. Mm -hmm. So um, so some people are important, you know, point out that, uh, for example, if researchers all agreed about what the most promising research areas were, they mm -hmm. might not be as eager to pursue them. And when they're each convinced that their research area is the best one, then they put more energy and enthusiasm into it. Mm -hmm. and therefore we all benefit from their research. So there are some ways in which um, perhaps that our disagreements can serve us. But I think mm -hmm. for the most part, no. Yeah, so, so is your hypothesis then, I mean, so if, if, if our, the, the tendencies, the biases that lead us into uh, sort of intractable disagreement, the irrational disagreement, um, if our standard of rationality is, um, you know, something fairly demanding like... Uh, uh, you know, like a uh, sort of Bayes theorem or something like that. Uh, if those are actually serving uh, our individual purposes, then would devoting yourself more, more wholeheartedly to the search for truth actually require you to sacrifice something important? Most likely, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, in the same way that many other high causes that we might devote ourselves to would uh, cause us to sacrifice something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we were, if you wanted to be an artist who wanted to make just one beautiful painting, you might have to neglect your family for, you know, 10 years while you did it, you know. Or you're, you know, you... Right, Paul, for example. Yeah, Paul Gauguin it, leaves his family uh, in France to go paint the natives in Tahiti or something like that. Makes him a horrible person in one way, but he was uh, just serving a, you know, maybe a higher calling. Higher cause. <laughs> right. I mean, in a sense, almost anything we choose that way. But I, I think um, many of your, our listeners here uh, won't be convinced yet that there is a trade-off. I think um, it takes a little work to uh, walk through that. I'm yeah. not sure. Are you, are you convinced? That there's a trade-off between being truth-seeking and uh, sort of personal happiness? 
uh, yes, or, or achievement or whatever else you want. Uh, I'm I'm almost certain that there's a that there's a trade off between because uh, uh, I, 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 as you know I've you know worked on happiness a bit and and there seem to be so many uh, ways in which uh, a, a certain kind of uh, uh, upbeat delusion uh, <laughs> keeps people feeling good um, and. Uh, yeah, and, and, and you know, and, and, you know, I studied philosophy for very, very many years, and it's just not—I mean, like, trying to really get at the root of things, I don't think, is really a recipe for satisfaction. Um, and, and, and that's why I do think there's this mismatch between uh, individual ends and sort of uh, and uh, perhaps uh, larger goals, because um, you know, you can, uh, you know, we would all be better off if there was more truth seeking or there was more truth finding uh, because there's lots of things we can do with the truth that can make us better off it gives us power over the world when we know what how it really works uh i think we we all accept at a general level that you know if we devoted our saturdays to uh, feeding the poor or mm -hmm. or researching the cure for world hunger you know the world might be better off and, and we see that we aren't devoting our saturdays to that and uh but when we choose our ordinary beliefs about uh, you know whether we should get a particular car or who we should vote for mm -hmm. or things like that, we don't tend to think that we see a trade-off there. Mm -hmm. we, we, we think we're being honest about most of these things. Um, and it's only when we look at, say, other people and why they don't agree with our political positions that we uh, bring out this hypothesis that people are biased and uh, it distorts their beliefs. But when we look at ourselves, we, we just usually don't think we see a problem. Mm -hmm. So what do you suspect is your... This is, this is a version of uh, Tyler's what's your most absurd belief question. Uh, what, what, because cause in a way, that question is what do you think your most biased belief is? Or what... You know, you know those are what two do, different questions. Well, what do other people think it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you think other people think yeah, it is? What do you th yeah, like yeah, that. that's right. Because you might th your most absurd belief, you might actually have access to, or you, had, you might have thought something through in a way that other people haven't. People do make discoveries, all right? You know? Right. And so people do, there, there are innovators who believe things that other people didn't believe uh, that other people think are absurd. Uh, but, uh, so, so, but, but, but I think we all have a sense that we have particular weaknesses as well. Like, like we are inclined to certain kinds of biases ourselves, or at least if you have a certain amount of self-knowledge, you do. Uh, so what do you think is your yeah. biggest weakness? Uh, what are you most liable, how are you most liable to be biased? Well, if we look at the topics on which I seem to have unusual beliefs, uh, they tend to be things like um, cryonics, uh, future of robots, uh, <laughs> foundations of quantum mechanics, um, the rationality of disagreement. Uh, so I guess if you look back and say, well, what do these things have in common? You might say, um, Robin uh, loves a long shot. Yeah. <laughs> he likes uh, these grand, uh, challenging ideas that have a chance of uh, turning things over. Um, but of course, uh, the fact that most people don't think they make sense means that they're uh, not that likely. Oh. So then, I'm, I, of course, I, I see that and I say to myself, well, yes, but I'm just thinking they're, they have a high enough chance to be interesting. And maybe even then you'd say, well, yes, but you still think the chances are higher than it's realistic. So that would be the uh, sort of account you could make of uh, my bias from that description. So do you think you tend to be I, overconfident uh, about these long shots? Well, that's the uh, interpretation that makes sense from just the mere fact that I'm, I, I like, <laughs> I, I seem to favor them. Uh, and, and I'm somewhat stuck in... Um, not being sure with how reasonable that is. Yeah, I mean, because uh, we, maybe we can talk about one. Yeah, well, I mean, I, yeah, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about a couple of these. Uh, I'll just stay at the meta level for just one more second. The, so, so the uh, because I mean, I take it that part of the reason that you're interested in biases is because you actually do think that a lot of these things, like the future of robots and cryonics, and uh, you know, betting markets and things like that, um, really that these things really are going to happen or the, 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 the probability of them working in a particular way, you think that you really do think that's higher than most people. And I think one of the things that you're trying to do is diagnose why most people don't agree with you about these things. Is it, don't, don't, wouldn't you say that's part of your motivation? Or, in or, or come to terms with the fact of the disagreement. I don't want to presume that it's uh, their fault necessarily. But yeah, so, so I, my history was uh, you know, getting involved with some things that were pretty 
countercultural or, or um, out of the popular view, and uh, coming to some you know unusual conclusions and uh, being in, immersed in communities like that for a while, and then uh, having to puzzle over why other people didn't agree with us. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this included, you know, I first got involved with the web back in the late 1980s mm -hmm. and a community of people that was forecasting that was coming this web and it was going to be great and here's what it would be and they were trying to make it happen and of course that was considered crazy by most folks. Mm -hmm. uh, it eventually did happen. <laughs> that same community of people was very interested in the future yeah. and nanotech and uh, cryonics and space travel eventually and then of course they felt excluded by most of those uh, topics. Um, and of course, most of them were libertarian, mm -hmm. and so libertarians tend to feel uh, this, you know, problem with uh, most people don't share their intuitions about political process. Uh, so, once you've realized that you're in these different communities, then you have to explain, well, why don't people agree with you? And it's way too easy to say, well, they just don't haven't heard my arguments. Yeah. Um, they, they won't sit down and listen, or, or they're just blind with their biases, or that you know they refuse to think or something. Um, that's just way too easy. Yeah. Because there are many people who have thought about these things and have listened, and they still aren't that persuaded. Yeah, so, I mean, I, it, it strikes me as, like, I mean, I, I mean I, I'm, I'm completely on board. I mean, I, 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 I like the ethos of humility that, 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 that you preach, that, that you, you have to make sure not to just put it on the other guy. Uh, but, uh, but once you recognize... So, you know how conformist people are. That doesn't that doesn't mean you have to exempt yourself. Um, but how how prone to all sorts of these little errors people are. Uh, how conformist people are. How um, subject to ostracism you can be for having uh, even mildly idiosyncratic beliefs. Right. Um, then th then it seems you know very very plausible to think that any time anybody has a good new idea. That uh, you know, public opinion is going to be sort of uh, you know going to be uh, pressing against that. Um, and and do I really need? So if I come up with sure. a great new idea, do I really have to think? Well, I really have to take into consideration that it might be me that's wrong because I mean. Well, yes, you do. Because yeah. you can't assume the great part. <laughs> you can assume the new. Maybe it's easier to tell if something's new, although it's actually. Harder than most people think to tell if their idea is new. Mm -hmm. But just because you have an idea that looks new doesn't mean it's great. Right. And in fact, I have to say, on average, most new ideas aren't so great. Yeah. Um, this is something I talk about in health economics. Uh, people are way too eager to get the latest new treatment mm -hmm. for whatever condition they have. They should stay away from the new treatments. <laughs> new treatments are on average worse than the old ones. Mm -hmm. It's only the few new treatments that end up being selected out of the process that are better. Mm hmm uh, so you, you do have to ask yourself, why am I so sure my new idea is so great? Yeah. And in fact, because most people who have an idea and they think it's great, it isn't, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. The, the track record's pretty lousy. Well, when we're talking about, and I, and I think I brought this up when I was talking to Tyler about disagreement, like one of the very thorny problems for me trying to think this through is to try to understand, um, because, because the fact that... Um, the, the fact that somebody who doesn't know anything about the topic disagrees with you, that doesn't really care any weight, right? You, the fact that somebody who knows at least as much as you do, that they agree with you, that matters a lot. Um, and the problem... Well, it's, it's actually... I'm not sure... I mean, I'm, it's not quite that simple. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, if, if people just looked at a topic, used their information, draw a conclusion, and that was it, then yes, people who know more would have uh, better decisions. Mm -hmm. But... If people look at a topic, draw a conclusion, and then interact with other people who've drawn conclusions, mm -hmm. and then their opinions respond to those others, mm -hmm. then it's no longer just the people who initially had the most information that are going to have the most accurate views. Uh, it's going to matter a lot more who listens well mm -hmm. to the other. Well, and, and also, um, and also so whether good ideas uh, tend to spread uh, better than bad ideas. Right, like, it, like if, if uh, sure. right, so if, if bad ideas were somehow sort of like more, uh, the, you know, the mind was a more hospitable climate to falsehood than to truth, uh, the fact that people believed something, uh, you know, given that presumption, the fact that people believed something sure. would be evidence that it wasn't true. So, I mean, you, 
you, so whether or not like a bunch of people disagree with you really does have to be, uh, you really have to wait to figure out what the process was by which they came to that belief, right? Well, you, if, if you, if it's the same process applying to you and them, then this doesn't cut, get very far. Then either we're all uh-huh. bad or we're all good. Uh, you're looking for differences between you and them, which might indicate whether you're more right than they are. Right. And so, and it does seem like so, there's uh, forms of expertise uh, that do give some people an epistemic edge over others, right? So, uh, you know, like, so you, you know Brian's work about people's biases when it comes to uh, sort of basic right. economic reasoning. Um, and you just take a poll of economists and a poll of regular people, and you get uh, wildly divergent answers about whether, uh, you know, protectionism or the minimum wage or... Uh, or immigration is a good or bad thing. Um, and so the expertise has to matter, right? It's, it seems to matter in that case, certainly. Uh, but I was trying to make the point that uh, many people are, are very confident to dismiss other people's views in situations where they are uh, relatively expert, where they have a degree or years yeah. of experience. Uh, then, But you turn it around, uh, and they're in a situation where they're disagreeing with somebody else who has more experience, more education, uh, Etc. And they aren't very differential. Yeah. Uh, they tend to find a bunch of other excuses why, in this case, uh, that's not so relevant. Mm-hmm. Or you often get uh, people so, who are like, uh, "I was, you know, the the uh, the funny next door neighbor in a long running sitcom, and now here I am on a congressional committee talking to you about the important issue of farm subsidies." Right. And so uh, you get, you know, you, yeah, you get famous. You think that would be more transparent to them. But yeah. No, no. Yeah. But <laughs> it's not. You get, you know, people who are famous and maybe this is, I mean, a, a general phenomenon. People who are famous and high status, I think people defer to their opinion more simply in virtue of the fact that they're high status. Whether or not their status has anything to do with the reliability Absolutely. of their opinions. But, of course, you tend to use this when you have a higher status than someone else. If there's a fifth grader who walks up to you and disagrees with you, you're going to say, he's just a fifth grader. Right. What does he know? Yeah. Uh, that's right. Because, you know, but, the, but that's the thing. If you think status is the game, right, which I think a lot of people do. I mean, maybe they don't think that in, uh, in explicit in terms. Consciously. Yeah, but if people are, you know, if they think that, uh, uh, you, know, you know, the status game is the game that they're playing, then you're going to use every advantage that you have. And and that's often going to be not conducive to uh, truth seeking, certainly. Right, you might not be aware of it, but at the moment you dismiss somebody of lower status and you pull rank, uh, you might realize well you're succeeding at establishing your status, but you might not be ex- succeeding at uh, r- modifying your opinions to reflect their information. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I mean, but this but this seems to me to like I get like. I, I don't think my it's not an objection it's just a worry that they come that, because you, you I've only got so much attention right I have uh, you know a budget of attention right. I have to allocate it uh, I'm going to want to right. allocate my attention to the people who are most likely to be reliable when speaking about the things that they know the most about um, and and so, and so I I don't want to allocate all sure. my attention to fifth graders. Um, do I just want to have a random uh, a strategy of just kind of listening to people randomly at, to see if I pick up bits and pieces of things, or do I want to focus on a, a, a small set of people who I judge to have a certain kind of special expertise, which makes their judgments just slightly more reliable? But then, of course, when people do that, when you start trying to pick and choose who you listen to, uh, people tend to just fall into a confirmation bias trap that they just start reading all the stuff of the people. Sure. So so how do you allocate attention in a way that's going to sort of diminish your own tendency to bias? Well, I, I'd, I'd rather factor the question into, uh, on the one hand, how do you allocate your attention? And then on the other hand, how do you draw conclusions from the attention you allocated? So even if you allocate your attention in very asymmetric ways, mm-hmm. There's still this question of uh, what conclusions you draw and how you correct for that. Yeah. Um, so as I said, I, I was I would make this relatively strong claim that uh, the the fact of system, being able to anticipate other people's disagreements with yourself, uh, to be able to foresee disagreements, is by itself uh, a key indication that there's uh, a lot of bias in one or both parties. Um, and so. Uh, when you see this world of people with differing opinions out there, and you, you know that they are somewhat aware of each other's opinions, this tells you that there's a lot of 
irrationality, at least in the sense of truth seeking, out there. Mm-hmm. And so you have to judge, you have to make some judgment about where sort of the distribution of error lies. You need some theory of, of what kind of people are more likely to be making mistakes. And relative to that sort of a theory, uh, you want to give a lot of weight to sort of the middle of the opinion of, of those people corrected for their error. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you, and, and that's very, I don't want to say inhuman, but it's kind of alien to our ordinary styles. Uh, we like to give sort of our thoughts on a subject and the people that we find, you know, that we're friends we get along with or that we sort of feel we can understand well a, a lot more mm-hmm. weight. So what, what would be, I mean, so if, if somebody wasn't biased, then, uh, I, I mean, how much should, as a matter of fact, people who are, uh, you know, raised in a Presbyterian household are more likely to be Presbyterian than average. Uh, people who are raised in a, you know, in a, in a household of, you know, convinced Democrats are more likely to themselves be convinced Democrats and so on and so forth. Um, so it, in, in, in an unbiased society, you'd expect there to be very, very little path dependency in people's beliefs given their starting point. Um, and so, and so that's one way where you can think about personally, like whether or not you're really being unbiased. So if you if you if you find that you Absolutely. still have the same religion as your parents and still have the same, uh, you know, uh, political ideology as your sure. parents, or that you have the same opinions on uh, you know art and fashion as all the people that you grew up with, then that's a sign of you know a shameful lack of independence. If you care about truth, right, uh, right, it's very disturbing. Uh, so it pushes you more in a direction that looks something like cultural relativism. Although I don't like that description. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we were talking a little bit more about this on the blog today, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yes, it should be very disturbing to you that uh, it so happens that your best judgment about, say, uh, which kind of people should be married to what other kind of people, uh, correlates strongly with uh, your parents told you and what your teachers told you, and. Uh, <laughs> Even though there's lots of other people at other times and places in the world who've said very yeah. different things, yeah, um, we wouldn't. We can't help. We wouldn't have reason to worry that. about that if if cultural transmission was just a highly reliable form of sort of truth preservation. Um, but y- you've got to know that it's not the case, well, given the sort of diversity and views on these same topics. Right. These cultures couldn't all knowingly have different views if uh, culture was such a reliable mechanism. Okay. Well, let's talk, let's talk some more about uh, some of uh, some of the things that other people think are crazy that you nevertheless think. Um, and, and, and so I'm, I'm I'm particularly interested in this one because I think I might do it, which is 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 cryonics, right? So what what okay. do you think is the probability that so so? But briefly explain what what cryonics is for people because a lot of people have just this idea that you know you're getting put in a freezer like with Walt Disney and then <laughs> something's going to happen to you later well, I actually have a visual oh, aid yeah. here I'll hold up to the camera <laughs> it's just a, a something that can go on my wrist that it just says that if uh, you know if I'm found in dire straits then they should call this company to uh, handle my remains mm-hmm. and uh, the concept is just that uh, as you all know our bodies uh, decay and die and uh, at some point you know burn or get eaten by worms and at that point there's very little prospect for ever bringing us back because the information that composed us is uh, dispersed to the ends of the universe Um, if we could somehow preserve uh, the key structure information that represented who we are then maybe in the future with technology we don't have now they can uh, reconstruct us and bring us back Uh, so the strategy is just that uh, in liquid nitrogen, for example, um, the rates of chemical reactions fall by many, many orders of magnitude so that uh, basically nothing happens. So if you can take somebody and get their body to a liquid nitrogen temperature, then that body will just stay that way for as long as you can keep it at that temperature. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, if people can later on um, look at that frozen remains of you and figure out what you were from that, and then they could reconstruct you. Uh, and so the, the concept of cryonics is that when uh, current medical technology gives up on you, uh, then instead of letting worms eat you, uh, we just uh, freeze you. 
and hope for the best. Now, obviously, the, uh, you can't be very confident this works. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is really what probability would you assign to it working to make it worth your while? Okay. So this is an exercise I go through in my health economics mm -hmm. class, and I would say a few percent probability of it working would seem to make it worth your while at ordinary uh, you know, value of life calculation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you ask, you know, a distribution of students what they, the chance they think it will work, actually, you know, a large fraction of them assign a probability over that threshold. Uh, yet, almost none of them ever do it. So, what do you think the probability is, Robin? That 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 it would that you can be, uh, you know, by whatever time it is that you're going to die, uh, that you'll be able to be sort of resurrected more or less through this process. So let's go over the things that can go wrong. Yeah. So first of all, obviously, I, I could die somewhere far away from uh, the capability to do this thing. Yeah. I could fall off a cliff or be, you know, mm -hmm. burn up in a house or something, and mm -hmm. then, then this just couldn't do it. So, but, uh, And then the money I spent on this would have to go somewhere else, uh, which is fine. Uh, then uh, this process could uh, destroy key parts of me. So uh, when they freeze people, uh, it's not a completely non-destructive process. They sort of move things around, mm -hmm. uh, cause chemical reactions. And so th that could you know, be so damaging that future people just couldn't figure out how to undo it. That's another thing that could go wrong. The third thing that could go wrong is that the, um, s the organization that's supposed to preserve you over this intermediate time could fail to do that. So we, we, we know that most mm -hmm. businesses and nonprofits even don't last for a century. Yeah. And if you need this to last a century, that's a challenging task for an organization to do. Mm -hmm. And finally, of course, uh, eventually, uh, even if they manage to preserve you through this time and there's a technology to bring you back, maybe nobody wants to. Mm -hmm. uh, so your, your risk of this working has to fold in all of those scenarios. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think the main risk is uh, that the organization would fail. Yeah. That's, so my, main, uh, the, uh, that's my main uh, area of skepticism as well. Right, so I think the actual, you know, the chance that enough information is preserved is pretty high. The chance that I'll be, you know, die in a situation where they could do this is pretty high. The chance that they would want to bring you back is pretty high, given how few people ever do this. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, can an organization that last that long? Of course, now there are scale economies here. The more of us do this, the more likely it is that we could manage to keep the organization lasting long enough. Mm -hmm. and, and the lower we can bring down the prices in this. So most of the prices here are fixed costs for the organization to have its facilities mm -hmm. and have the capability of doing this. Mm -hmm. Uh, marginal costs are a lot, are relatively low. Now, now I understand that this doesn't actually cost that much, in in, in the sense that you you can right. actually just take out a life insurance policy, uh, make sure. the cryonics place the beneficiary of your policy, and that basically right. pays for uh, your sure. suspension. I mean, it costs a lot more than a big screen TV, yeah. <laughs> or even than a Hummer, perhaps, <laughs> but. You know, compared to the kind of other expense people put into uh, the uh, their, at the end of their life and trying to extend it, this is relatively small. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so if you thought if you thought like me that say there might be a five percent chance of this working, then that should be enough to uh, make it worth your while if you put a, a comparable value on the kind of life you would have then. Now, of course, one possibility is that uh, if this you know life starts again in a century from mm -hmm. now and al almost all of your friends are gone, then such a life to you is worth so little that it's not worth the bother. Yeah, yeah. That's conceivable, but uh, for people like you or me, I think that's not plausible. Yeah. Well, I mean, Carrie and I are thinking about doing it together, partly because it just seems really right. romantic. I don't think people have seen the ro right. the romance involved. Like, 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 I love you so much, I want to be together forever, so even if the odds are low, let's have ourselves frozen right, right. for one another. Well, I... I I wish there could be more of that. I mean, part of what goes on here is this concept has been around for four yeah. decades. And in, 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 it's not been obscure. People, as soon as this thing first came out, people loved to have newspaper yeah. articles about it and special TV specials. It, it just was so videogenic that, that people loved to tell stories about it. So a lot, you know, millions and millions of people have heard about this. And only a few hundred people actually over four decades have decided this yeah. was worth, worth it for them. So at some level, there's a puzzle. Why are so few people interested in this? Yeah, well... I and it's one of the puzzles I like to use yeah, I, I, think about yeah, I, in, in the context of health. Yeah, when I've been thinking about, I, we we did an issue of Cato Unbound recently about sort of radical life extension, and when I was thinking about that issue while editing uh, uh, that uh, edition of Cato Unbound, I, I was really thinking about um, 
I, th- I think people have a, a problem in even conceiving of what it would mean to have uh, sort of an unbounded budget of time or a less bounded budget of time. So, so like the analogy that I like to draw is that is that up until the era of modern growth, uh, everybody just took it for granted that what we would now consider uh, you know, crushing poverty uh, is the only thing you could ever hope for. Um, and so, so people's incomes were always very, very, very small, and people did, did, didn't know what it would mean to have a, you know, an income that was, you know, many hundreds of times that size. Um, and likewise, now I think I guess we, well, it's we just, just hard for me to buy the story that the real limit here is people of, uh, can't conceive of the concept of living again that, after that, that they were frozen for a while. The budget of time uh, that we're allotted in the life is very small, that, that and we structure the everything. They, they, they get it. <laughs> they get the concept that they could uh, I think I might have live again, um, but they're still not interested. On and it's not so much a uh, for other thing. Hey, I guess we got cut off somehow. Robin. You yeah. there? Sorry. Okay. We got cut off somehow, I guess. We got cut off somehow, but now we're back. Okay, and what was the, the last thing you heard me say? The last thing I said is, it was so saying is that, is that, edit that, this that, yeah, that we've, just so, we've reconciled ourselves so thoroughly to the idea of uh, this very small lifespan uh, and that we've reorganized our entire society and our entire expectations about what it means to have a life around that, so that when you start talking about, say, radical life extension or about you know sort of res- you know scientific resurrection, um, people's minds just like they kind of blank out. Um, there's not the conceptual well, tools no, to maybe- even think about uh, a much larger uh, budget of time. But I don't think it's the size of the time budget that's the yeah. barrier. I, like, when you talk to people about this scenario, they get the idea of living again after a period of being frozen. Um, maybe it's hard to imagine how long you'd live and what would happen then, but they get the idea of living and living being better than yeah. dying. Um, uh, yet they're not interested. Well, I mean, don't you think part of it is, part. is is that you, you really do you do have to have your expectations adjusted to something? And so if I keep thinking that, oh... You know the singularity is going to come any day now, or oh, maybe I'll be able to uh, you know uh, be uploaded into a computer after I've been frozen for 200 years. Uh, that 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 what you're doing is just courting disappointment, and people don't like that. So um, it's almost better to just reconcile yourself to the normal kind of life. So if you start making arrangements to have yourself frozen, then you're getting your you're getting your hopes up in a way that can be disappointed. If you just if you just do it like everybody else does, maybe some happy accident will happen. But you, I... I guess you could tell the story that, you know, people just don't want to think about death because it's unpleasant and uh, they'd rather pretend they're not going to die. And people tell that story about why they don't fill out their wills. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then they're certainly very willing to, uh, you know, get buy health insurance mm-hmm. and lobby governments to offer free <laughs> health coverage, you know, under this presumption that they are thinking about these things that can go wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm not sure how far you get with that. Yeah, uh, I think there's a lot to the idea that people don't want to think about death, and so they don't want to walk very deep into the chain of reasoning about it. They want to have a very simple, pat answer and be done with it. But what is the aversion to thinking about to death? Why Why would you be averse to it? Is it bad um, for you well, to think about death? I mean, I mean because like, if you're thinking, is there some sort of Darwinian function to sort of evading the subject? And I don't see what that would be. So I, I agree that there's not an obvious Darwinian function of not thinking about death. So if, if it's something we have a problem with, it seems more of a, a side effect of other mm. uh, ways our minds are made. People have told you know the standard stories that uh, whenever we imagine something, we're sort of vicariously experiencing that thing and you know enjoying the uh, experience of it. And uh, when you imagine death, it's uh, supposed to be a terrible experience, mm. and we don't like that. We don't want to imagine that. Um, Clearly, a lot of our religions and other sort of uh, important uh, ideological and, and religious uh, feelings and beliefs are tied up around death, mm-hmm. and uh, so clearly it's something that we uh, have, are very sensitive about. Well, Robin, are you, are you um, afraid of dying? 
I don't want yeah, to but die. Are, but do and, you, uh, do you, do you <laughs> fear it? I mean, do you, do you like when you think about dying, sure, you yes, get afraid? Absolutely. Yes, I think that's an accurate description. I think I'm like everybody else that way. I, I don't like it. I want to get it out of my mind quickly. I want to think about something else. I want to find an excuse to go somewhere else mm. from the conversation because it's not a pleasant thought. Yeah. But surely you can't be any well, different. Well, no, I think this is one of my outlier things. I, I, maybe this is a philosophical gene or something like that. I've always had a hard time even understanding what it would mean to be afraid of death because uh, death isn't anything, right? It's right. What's there to be afraid of? Nothing, right? Uh, and, and I mean... <laughs> Well, the experience of death yeah, is nothing. Yeah, the experience of death is nothing. I mean, I, I'm afraid of suffering, uh, very much so. Okay. Uh, but I'm not afraid of my life ending, um, and I know that that's really weird. I like I've, I've, I have fights with Carrie about that. She doesn't understand how I could not be afraid of my life ending, but I'm just not. I just don't know what it means to be afraid of it. it my life is just over. There's nothing. There's nothing more. I don't want it to end. Uh, so, but not wanting it to end doesn't strike me as the same thing as being afraid of it ending. Uh, so I think I'm. I think some of us are that way about other topics. I don't know if I'm that way yeah. about uh, death, but I guess I'm more that way about some aspects of social status or uh, uh, social science. So I think of myself as a nerd in many ways that uh, didn't intuitively understand the social mm -hmm. world. And so was um, willing to sort of analyze it mm -hmm. and to uh, think about things that other people find obvious. So most people navigate their way through the social world intuitively, and when they think about why somebody does something or what they are going to do next, their uh, social intuitions give them a clear answer, and they don't think it's yeah. puzzling because it's sort of the obvious thing they would expect to happen. And it takes somebody who doesn't have that sort of a clear intuition to ask, yeah, but why do they do that? Yeah. Um, I think, but maybe because our theories maybe you're the same as me because I, I I did not understand social status or status signaling uh, until I started specifically studying the question. It was something that always completely eluded me, at least in consciousness. So so whenever I'd read a theory like Robert right. Frank's about how status how, how sort of how status crazy people are, I would always be like, oh come on, people don't really care so much about this uh, because I I don't know I was Absolutely. deaf to it in my own case. Um, but uh, but so I had to think my way into uh, these things that actually really do obsess people. And, and these are, for me, I mean, these have been the biggest revelations of my life. That is, the biggest things that completely floored me and were contrary to my initial expectations were ways, these simple stories of evolutionary psychology or status seeking mm -hmm. and various versions of sociology that sort of talk about sort of an underlying uh, structure of what we want and how we get it that's at complete odds with most of my life's conscious thoughts. Yeah. Right? I, I, I never thought very consciously about, you know, trying to achieve status and trying to make babies and, and trying to get other people to, you know, submit to my dominance and things like that. That never entered my conscious right. thoughts. But uh, when I look back at my behavior, I have to say these theories account reasonably well for my yeah. behavior and other people's behavior. And that's really quite shocking. So what do you think the effect of... Oh, so, so suppose you've been thinking you know, very clearly, you know, lucidly, explicitly about uh, status-seeking dominance and sort of, you know, mate competition. Uh, what does that actually do to you if you think about that explicitly? Uh, so, so suppose I was just sort of blithely stumbling through the world, sure. not really concerned about my social status in, a, in an explicit way. Um, of course, you know, you're, you're uh, alive to these things in a sort of subconscious way. Um, but now that I realize that I've always been interested in status in the way a normal person is, um, do I use the information that I've gained about it to actually sort of help me win these status competitions? Or do I just decide that it's still kind of gross to be motivated this way, which is what I always thought, uh, and kind of resign myself to, uh, you know, to, to this Zen approach that maybe I'll get high status by not caring about high status, um, even though that's unrealistic. I mean, do you, do you think once you know about this stuff, it gets in your way of actually uh, implementing the best strategy? In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Yeah, okay. I mean, so, so, obviously, now that I see these things, I see that in many ways the most successful people in the world are people who see this stuff uh, often consciously and use it to their mm -hmm. advantage. They, they look for cues about the subtext of an interaction and uh, they, you know, try to uh, give the right cues and uh, those of us who weren't never consciously paying attention to the cues that were sort of missing all that. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, um, it 
can also get in the way. Um, so there are many sort of of our most important relationships, our intimate relationships, and our friends, where uh, our self-conscious, our, our conscious uh, concept of that relationship is t deeply tied into certain concepts of sincerity. Mm -hmm. That uh, we really sincerely like our yeah. friends, <laughs> and uh, not for any other reason but then for who they are. Yeah. And then thinking more consciously about yes, but how plausible is that, <laughs> given all this other behavior? Yeah. I mean, like uh, studies that, that show that sort people of tend way. to have friends who are about as attractive as they are. Right. Right. That, which 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 doesn't seem consistent with it. Just you know, I just like everybody for who they are. Right, but it's very consistent with an idea that I want to be around the sort of people who are going to themselves tr attract the kinds of people that I might be attracted. You know, so there's all sorts of things in your daily life that uh, that that are kind of sit uneasily with just sincerity, even though well, you want to believe. I like it. to think about this in terms. Yeah. Right, I want, like to think about the difference between what people call as cynicism and idealism. Mm -hmm. So. Um, most of literature, in terms of you know explicit social science and uh, policy, I, I think takes on what you'd call a more idealistic voice. It, it assumes that the motivations people give for themselves are their actual motivations, and that people actually do are tra trying to achieve high mm -hmm. ideals. And um, then there's this other un well-known undercurrent or current in conversation in the world, which is the cynical voice. And the cynical voice has always been describing these uh, lower motivations of behavior and what's really going on. And people have always sort of had to hear something of that uh, cynical voice, but uh, they've tried to keep it out of sort of our high-minded uh, official mm -hmm. voice. So, you know, you, you rarely see, hear the cynical point of view voiced in ordinary say, classroom discussions right. or, uh, you know, policy documents or the president's annual uh, statement or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, We're all status-seeking creatures who are trying to find a mate <laughs> so that we can maximize the number right. of genes in future generations. You know, like you, the president never says that. Let's go to the moon, so we look. Yeah, let's go to the moon, so our nation looks dominant, and other countries will look up to us, and we can go over there, yeah. and, and they'll defer yeah. to us. Well, I mean, you actually, you do get that. Sometimes you do get that. At an, at, at, you know, people will think, well, as a, as a matter of defense, other people have to be scared of us. Uh, but right. but uh, but you never get this. I, I mean, I was in a debate recently on uh, somebody's blog about uh, you know these the Barack Obama's exhortations uh, for to individuals to um, he said you know he said something like uh, uh, the only individual salvation is collective salvation uh, and uh, and you you know and you can only yeah sounds nice yeah uh, and. and uh, you know, anybody, and he's exhort, you know, exhorting us to sort of, you know, uh, attach ourselves to a project that's bigger than ourselves, uh, namely um, the project of electing Barack Obama, uh, which is b bigger yep. than us. Uh, but it happens to be good for Barack Obama. Uh, and right. uh, but 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 you know, Barack Obama would never say, you know what? I think I would really enjoy the experience of being an incredibly high status primate. Uh, and I'm going to crush right. all those who stand in my way. Uh, you know, because the, the way you crush all those who stand in your way is by using exalted rhetoric that kind of covers up your ambition. Well, unfortunately, I think there's a, what I've called the cynic's conundrum, mm -hmm. uh, which is that um, cynicism is sort of assigning low motives to people's behavior, and uh, idealism is assigning high motives to behavior. And there's the question of what motivates the cynic. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the cynical explanation of uh -huh. the cynic is that uh, he's a loser who's griping and complaining. Yeah. And uh, because he can't win the regular game, he's going to try to bring everybody yeah. down. And, uh, you know, and the, the idealistic I'm just explanation jealous of Barack that the cynics Obama. often yeah. try to offer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, that... Uh, the idealistic explanation is, no, we have such high standards, and we are so offended by the fact that people don't live up to our, the high standards we expected that we are just outraged and must tell everybody uh, how outraged we are that people are not living up to our high mm -hmm. standards. And honestly, that idealist explanation just doesn't cut it as plausibly as the cynical explanation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, how about, how <laughs> about um, I mean, because, because sometimes, you know, I... I you know, I don't doubt the. I, I I don't know what I am in this in this taxonomy. I'm pretty cynical, 
Um, but and, and you know, I don't know what my deeper motives are. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think I really do care about how well other people fare. Um, and one of the reasons I'm so insistent on uh, what I think of as realism about people's motives, about the you know the cynical explanation for uh, both sort of economic and political and all sorts of behavior, is that if we take into account this cynical explanation, we'll be able to have institutions that actually function well in delivering the kinds of things that do make people's lives go well. So I, I feel like my that you, you'll right. te- you tend to best serve idealistic ends by accepting cynical explanations. But th- those things might be intention, and it might be hard to... Uh, yes, there is a tension yeah. there. And maybe that's um, why people so all, I automatically think, think that like certain kinds of libertarians are bad people, partly because maybe we have a somewhat cynical explanation of behavior, and so it's hard for people to believe that you really care about the ideals that you profess right? to care about, because if you did, you wouldn't be so cynical about why people do what they do. Right. I mean, obviously, it's not a reliable estimate in each case, but I think that it's on average true. I mean, I, my guess is that on average, libertarians are more selfish people than other mm-hmm. people. Um, that's, I think you just got to face up to that and admit that. I, I think you also have to face up to the idea that your idealism, however sincere, uh, is going to be expressed in detail in ways that are largely uh, serving your interests in other mm-hmm. ways. Um, that it's going to be very hard for you to monitor all the ways in which you express your idealism to uh, to avoid that outcome because it's what you were built to do. Um, so I, I do think we have to grant that there's a certain amount of idealism in people and that they express it to a certain mm-hmm. degree and that that can be useful to uh, tap into that uh, socially. So I think the idea that we should completely ignore idealism when doing social analysis mm-hmm. is wrong. We should certainly assume there's some fraction yeah. of it and that in some situations it may be crucial. Um, but... Uh, Yes, you know, overestimating how much of it there is and how much you can rely of it on it is is a mistake. Well, th- I mean, th- this raises an interesting, uh, you know, a hypothesis, Robin, that that uh, that the supply of actual idealistic motivation uh, might increase as the goods that people are trying to uh, acquire become easier to acquire. So, suppose if if you have, uh, I think I lost Robin once again. Hold on just one moment as I dial up Robin on the somewhat unreliable Skype. Hello? (laughs) Really? Sorry. No problem. Um, I don't know why we keep getting dropped. Yeah, me, me neither. We keep getting dropped somehow. But it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. This is fun, though. I'm enjoying well, it. Me, me too. We've got about maybe ten minutes left. Uh, so, so let's uh, let's j- jump to uh, one more of uh, uh, of your top. But let's let's make it uh, Hanson's choice. Uh, what what topic uh, do you want to get off your chest? <laughs> well, I thought we uh, had some things we could disagree about about disagreement. So. Uh, in, in your discussion with Tyler or otherwise, I thought you were hinting at perhaps having, or perhaps on uh, paternalism and uh, uh, t- when is paternalism appropriate uh, for across different cultures. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in finding something we disagree a little bit about and exploring that. Um, hmm. Well, one thing I disagree, and I think you agree with Tyler about disagreement, is, is, is that it makes sense for people to assign probabilities to most of their beliefs. And I'm still not convinced of that. That it makes sense to have probabilities on your beliefs. Yeah, th- I mean, I, that's the thing. You yeah, that, that, that it's either uh, it's either that it's even a reasonable demand that people have a uh, a sense of the uh, probability of most of their beliefs. Well, l- let's condition on a perception of a disagreement. Mm-hmm. So, if you have an opinion, however you express it to yourself, and you perceive that you disagree with somebody mm-hmm. else. I would think you could grant that that perceived disagreement could be interpreted as a sort of difference in probabilities. That, uh, you know, if you said Bush is great and I say Bush is terrible, that uh, 
or, or for example, you say, if we pull the troops out of Iraq, it'll collapse mm -hmm. into uh, uh, chaos, and I say, no, it'll be fine. Even if we don't assign probabilities verbally or even in our minds that uh, that is well described as us disagreeing about a probability. And in the ordinary use of those words, you would be, one person might be saying the probability is over 50% and the other saying mm -hmm. it's below. Is that problematic? Or? Um, well, I mean, I, I, think, I think if we are sort of a, doing a kind of reinterpretation of people's behavior, that if once you assent to a proposition, that obviously you're saying that it's more likely than not to be true. Um, but I don't think there's any sense in which uh, it's clear that people do or ought to have identified the range between sort of, you know, 0.5 and 1, uh, th where they sit, you know, when they say that, yes, I believe P, right? They, they just say, P, you know, it's more binary for most people. You either do or you don't believe it. Um, sometimes persuasion happens, but persuasion happens uh, generally to the extent that people's sense of identity is wrapped up in getting things right. Um, a lot of times people just make commitments. Um, sure. And, uh, and okay, but we, we can still describe that as, I mean, if the issue is, you know, was it naturally probability or is it only described reasonably as probability, I'm not sure it matters that much uh, which way we say that. Uh, I think it's enough to say that when people disagree that we can sort of identify some probabilities that are between their uh, different opinions. Right. So, so were um, people to bet uh, on uh, the truth of their belief, you know, how would they bet? Right. Like, what would be their disposition? You know, they, 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 they might have right. some settled disposition to, uh, to behave a certain way in a, in a betting market, given the possibility of that, right? Well, that would be one way of mm -hmm. cashing it out. There'd, there'd be a variety of others, but you could say that given that they were the sort in that sort of mental state that they were in, it's plausible to think that if they were offered a bet, they would have accepted certain bets, or if they were asked what probability to assign, they would have assigned a probability or something like that. that that's enough to get us to be able to use those descriptions as to talk mm -hmm. about their beliefs. I'm not sure how much it matters that it was what was in their mind yeah. at the time. Well, I mean, I think it does matter because I think when you're thinking about when people are disagreeing, it's important to try to figure out what's happening. Or is what pe if what you think people are doing when they're disagreeing is trying to negotiate the probability of their convictions, um, then it will seem really unreasonable that the, the you know the probabilities don't tend to converge somewhat as they sort of present one another with evidence. Um, but if what people are doing is simply signaling or expressing commitments, or I mean, in a lot of times what persuades well, people to come around, you don't change the probability of your belief. What you think is, right. is so, um, I think that if I care about these kinds of things, then I will support Barack Obama, right? What, that's the implicit premise, right? That's actually what your belief is. That sure. if I, okay, and, so and then once I convince then, you that you can care about those same things by supporting somebody else, that's when people change their mind. But it's not, but they're not actually changing their mind about the things that they're actually arguing okay. about. The actual well, so disagreement this tends basic... to be submerged. So uh, since you have a philosophy background, we can talk in you know, standard philosophical terms. Uh, people have expressions and uh, thoughts and uh, feelings and words that mm -hmm. they say, and only some of those can be well described as uh, beliefs about mm -hmm. the world, right? Some of them are just attitudes, uh, expressions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it could be that, you know, if they're saying, I'm for Obama, that doesn't mean they really have any particular beliefs about Obama and his consequences. It's more of a, a matter of a social mm -hmm. stance and an identification and a, what al who they're picking as an ally or something. Uh, so to the extent that they aren't actually saying anything about the world, then you could say they aren't disagreeing about the world. And so uh, it's not a topic of disagreement in that mm -hmm. sense. And you might say there's other kinds of disagreements besides disagreeing about what's true. And I'm happy to grant that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my focus is on the fact that many people do quite often think that they are disagreeing about what's yeah. true. And um, g given their perception that they th think they disagree about what's true, I think it's almost always reasonable to describe that as some disagreement about the probability of some claim, mm -hmm. uh, even if they aren't consciously thinking of it in those terms. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm open to being told otherwise. 